Okay. I will actually start off uh, sort of half serious on that. You, you did an investor day about, gosh now, probably about three or four months ago, I remember. September. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in it, you talked about, um, I suppose, using AI to help track commercial card receipts as part of, I suppose, MasterCard's new enhanced small business offering. Now, today, whether we like it or not, cards still represent a relatively small share of business payments. You know, if you look at the big picture, it's not huge. How do you see features like this changing it and how MasterCard's interacting? Obviously, for you to raise this whole area at your investor day, you do see it as a focus. But maybe you could tell us a bit as you know, chief product officer, tell us a bit more about the products and what you're doing in that space. Great topic, talking about products. All right, good morning, everybody. So uh, Investor Day, we talked about a lot of things. Um, SME, small business, medium enterprise, was an interesting topic because if you take a step back, it is the largest employer in the world. Um, so it kind of matters, matters to governments, um, matters to business. And from a payment perspective, there's a way to think about products for SMEs that are, you know, it's kind of like classic card products. So is your whatever small business co-brand or something like that. But the thinking has really quite dramatically changed over the last 10 years or so. It's thinking about small and medium um, enterprises as uh, entities that accept payments and not only make payments. So the whole um, space of emerging um, acceptance solutions, pin on phone, pin on glass, push payments, QR, biometrics, all that kind of stuff, enabling micro merchants, small merchants with different tools, lowering the cost of acceptance, all that kind of stuff is a whole important space. And when it comes to, but that's largely revolving around the, the world of cards. And as you said, the majority of payments is actually happening in some other way. Um, so what we said about uh, four years ago is, why don't we become the one-stop shop partner for payments? The opportunity is four times the size. M most payments are made from one bank account to another. How about we have a solution that covers that? Ideally, we have uh, solutions that are converged from a card to a bank account, from a bank account to a mobile wallet, from anything to anything. Really doesn't matter. That's what we put out um, at the Investor Day uh, last year. And actually, we put it out first 2017. We said, okay, the reach of our network needs to include everything that's out there. That has totally redefined the company, and we see the market going there. Real time is real, it's here to stay, so we are pretty convinced of that. So we love cards, but we love real time as uh, dearly um, as we love cards by now. We had to learn it, we had to love it, <laughs> had to learn to love it. But you know, it doesn't even stop there. It's blockchain, and then you think lately, um, you know, with uh, PSD2 going live also in September last year, API-based connections, direct connections that can facilitate data, but also payments. Um, there's a whole, a whole new trend there. Um, and then th you think blockchain. So in the end, it's like the ABCD of, uh, of uh, payment rails, account to account. B for blockchain, C for cards, D for data, and whatever the next letters well, are going to be. Well, you have also mentioned the QR stuff, because MPQR in Africa yeah. is big, isn't it? There's, yeah, it's push payments, there's QR, the Chinese are pushing this around the world. So it, it has to be all rails, and then in the end, you know, with rails and reach, that's fantastic, but SMEs have problems. Huh? They have problems on one side of the transactions. You make a payment, you want to know where your payment, when it's going to arrive, you want to have the right kind of data coming with it. Sometimes it goes cross-border. So you've got to have a bunch of products that sit on the rails. And this is how our product portfolio has totally changed today um, from basically a brand business 10 years ago around consumer credit to a whole range of products covering across all rails. And the core competencies that run across all of this, which is the center really of our business, is trust, safety, security related products. And how are you using the sort of AI data extraction stuff? Because that was a key point you mentioned at the Investor Day, wasn't it? You know, when you um, um, think cash flow projections, so what is the main issue that SMEs have? Well, um, is how to uh, get enough working capital and manage your access to credit. How do you drive um, an efficient credit decisioning process? And the data streams that are available for, for that are some obvious ones. It's, it's payment transactions, for example, but it's some less obvious ones, like your um, stock management system. 
So let's say you order that much uh, into your inventory and you sell that much, that is very valuable data to drive a uh, credit decision. So we're using AI to, to take that data, um, do some cash flow projections, share it with a bank that's a willing lender in the space and say, now you can make a credit offer in a much different way. Particularly for emerging markets, this is hugely important because classic bank decisioning in SME isn't available there. So we're going for alternative data sources and we're using our AI muscle to do that. So that's one example. So AI basically permeates all of our products, but that was one SME example. Okay. It's interesting you talk about stock control and stuff because that naturally leads one into what I'm going to call the retail SME sector, which leads one again into the retail sector. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a huge change in how customers, I suppose, not only pay, but what's the technology going on at that, that area of interface. Um, and I mean, we all talk about the Uber experience, you, know, you get out without paying from a, from a taxi. But how are you seeing that change in terms of MasterCard and, and that whole retail experience changing? Yeah. So the other day I did get out of a taxi and it was not an Uber and I didn't pay and <laughs> the taxi driver was not very happy with me. Um, so it does change, clearly payment technology does change behavior. Now, um, the retail space and retail technology, in-store uh, uh, retail tech is, a, is an important space. We actually don't really do this as a company, um, but we experiment with it because we want to see where, where the industry is going. So in MasterCard Labs, um, uh, one of our alpha rooms is dedicated to, uh, to retail tech. And things like the convergence of online and, and offline retail is interesting. So using computer vision, you recognize the sneaker, um, you try the sneaker on in store, but the sneaker isn't either in your size or your, in your color, but it fits really well. So you take the physical experience and you press on your app and you buy, um, you buy it online and you have it delivered next day. It's one of those things. So the computer vision angle, put that in directly linked into the payment system. Um, that is one example of what we're experimenting with. So what we see as trends is this online offline thing. It's AR, VR. Um, it is, um, it's uh, generally a lot of VC money going into this space, so we track um, uh, fintech investments. So what we do um, in the space is specifically, there is a set of products that we have for that. Um, one is um, using uh, blockchain technology to prove the provenance of products. So in retail, increasingly so, people have no idea on is the product actually what it claims to be. So through the blockchain, through the, way, uh, the whole value chain, um, you can prove this product is what it claims to be. Uh, just launched that. Uh, we launched it, interestingly enough, for food stuff. So you can go and buy shrimps now um, in the US, and you stand in front of the shrimp stand, and you uh, scan the QR code, and it will actually show you a picture of the fisherman um, that was catching your shrimp. So, wow. sounds like a niche case, but I, I believe it might be very big one day. Well, no, so. I mean, I have heard of this from the sort of the Louis Vuitton type scenario of, of checking that, same. Same that bag is genuine and pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical, same thing. Yeah, the, 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 the brand. Now, um, when it comes to um, that whole space, I, I said we experiment with this, but it's not a mainstream product because we're not in front end CX. But we do partner with people that, that do that and plug that into our world. So two recent examples out of uh, the world of fintech partnerships, which probably there's a few in the room here, is one, one is ZigZag. ZigZag goes, into, uh, goes to optimize the return value chain. So a lot of people buy 10 things to try them out and then they actually really just want to buy one. In my home country in Germany, 60% of online orders are being returned. Wow. And that is a massive inefficiency, and it's causing all sorts of sustainability issues and so forth. So ZigZag has a um, technology that optimizes that. Another one that I find personally really interesting is if you get served up an Instagram with some sort of product you've never heard about, but it reads brilliantly, and then you immediately have the question, is this real, is it not real? Um, and the likes on it don't tell you anything. So we're partnered with a company called True Rating um, that gives you the actual experience of people who at a checkout, either online or in store, said, I like this or I didn't like it. And they pull the data into um, you know, companies who sell through the social commerce uh, channel. Fascinating space. So we'll see where it goes, but uh, one day you should visit our alpha room. Question then, sort of picking up on that. We talk about this sort of getting out the Uber without paying. And, and, and we've seen it in other places where you almost got this face pay where you walk out of the store without you know, paying. 
the other research I've said is consumers actually like the idea of actually paying because actually they're worried of walking out the store and being nicked for shoplifting. Yeah, you know, they like the idea of actually having paid because they know they're safe. I, I'm just wondering if, if you see any of that in terms of your research and understandings that. Yeah, there's this whole notion of the frictionless future. So if it gets too frictionless, people yeah. do get worried. Uh, our, our research does show that. Um, th there's other aspects about frictionless. If you think you're a bank and uh, the payment experience is so frictionless that the bank doesn't show up anywhere with a brand, or MasterCard doesn't show up anywhere with a brand. So in the whole digital world, who's putting themselves in the front and associating a great experience with the consumer? Um, th there is uh, some, some challenges involved in that. So th th what we advocate for is basically uh, a level playing field that says the bank's got to show up and the cart art needs to show that it's, you know, it's a trusted payment because our research also shows if, it's, if you cannot identify that this is a MasterCard payment or you know, somebody yeah. else's payment at least, there is, we don't really quite know can we trust this. So the trust element if it's too frictionless, yeah. people get worried. So we can actually deal with that. To it, then. I'm sorry? There's a whole trust side to it then, really There's is. There's a very big trust side to it, generally when it comes to payments. It's about money. It's about your hard-earned money. And is this changing now and developing given where we're going on sort of emerging technologies around 5G, IoT, you know, it, the quantum computing? You know, to me, this is quite interesting because what, you know, when you go to a Mobile World Congress and stuff, when you see it all colliding like that, there seems to be a huge challenge of this maintaining of trust issues, I would argue. Yeah, um, I think probably the aspect that is most challenging for uh, out there is where's my data going, who has my data, what kind of data is with whom in the ecosystem. I think you talked about Internet of Things just now. So in the Internet of Things, all these connected devices, there is you know, so much more data than we can even imagine or that we even have today out there. The, the risks associated with that, unaccounted devices with no security updates, collating data, et cetera, is something that I think we as an industry need to get our head around. Um, so that's one example where there is probably a bit of a trust deficit or you know, a trust crisis even. Um, when you look at um, other aspects, is about just data, good data practices. So you get one of these emails, it says, we have just updated our privacy promise. I don't know if anybody in this room ever clicked on one of them, but if you actually do click on one of them, you'll find six, seven pages of fine print that, that will explain to you what the data privacy rule actually is. Um, that's not strong consent. If you think about where here in Europe PSD2 uh, open banking is going, it's about protection of consumer data, essentially. So we looked at this and said, it's weird. Huh? So you don't understand what you've just signed. You're putting data somewhere into the payment ecosystem, and we're not clear enough about it. So a principled approach, a simple approach, might be just a way to do it. Just a couple weeks ago, we launched something called the data, uh, the data responsibility imperative. Horrible word. We should rethink that. But uh, what it actually says is it takes the regulatory language of GDPR and translates into something really quite simple. And it's simple as you, as the consumer, we all, you own your data, you control your data, and you benefit from your data. Um, and we protect your data. And if you take that and say, and we kind of put that out there and say around the world, not just in Europe, we will do exactly that. So if you call us up and say, got to delete what you, what you have about me, then we will do that. It also means for, let's say, authentication of a payment, we will only collect the minimal amount of data needed to authenticate the payment. We will not collect PII, we will not sell your data, all that. Those are all translations of the very simple principles. And we reached out into the ecosystem, you know, it's payment facilitators, all these other folks out there in, in our world and said, we'd like you to join us in living up to these principles. I think that's a way to address trust. Because the more complex our ecosystem is, people will have more questions. And stuff that people don't inherently trust will not scale. So the next FinTech with a brilliant idea, if there's an underlying question mark, will most likely not get to scale. But if you all say we were to say, yeah, maybe these four principles, people will try it. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's quite a bold move, actually, to, to I really... I think so. It's not always easy on the business side to do that, but uh, I think it's the right thing to do. Okay. 
Um, well, as you said, we have a room full of fintechs here. Um, it's not that full, actually. <laughs> no, OK. It's the ones that made it from the after party and still made it here at a reasonable time. Um, yes. Um, but so I, I think it'd be wrong for me not to ask, um, as we have a senior person of MasterCard on the stage here, um, which, uh, which sort of companies you're looking to buy next? Because you have been, in the last sort of couple of years, fairly acquisitive in your nature of buying companies. Um, you know, we have startups here, obviously, at the Paris FinTech Forum. You know, what sort of companies should they be looking to start that MasterCard are these days investing in and buying? And I know it's not your, you're not the M&A person, but you are the head of products. So what are the products you're looking for your M&A team to buy, basically, or get you into? So, so many people, so yesterday I was walking around with this badge and then eventually I turned it around um, because I was starting to get, hey, you, uh, you know, these other guys bought Plaid, uh, would you like to buy us? <laughs> so, so it's kind of a stressful day. Only 50 times, <laughs> multiples roughly. Yeah, yeah. so um, no, the, the way we look at M&A is, um, is there's all these spaces that we just definitely don't want to be in. We don't want to be in front end customer experience, we're B2B to C. So we look somewhere in the second B space and see what do we do there. Um, there's things that relate to our core business, the classic card business, differentiation. I give an example, it's loyalty, for example. So we, we have been buying companies in the loyalty space, but we're now the largest loyalty provider in the world, so we're good. Um, then you look at uh, diversification, where we diversify our existing business in new countries, in new verticals. So vertical software providers reach a distribution in geographies that we haven't been in is an area on how we think about ex uh, extending inorganically. And in the most, the most uh, you know, vibrant space where, where we look for um, bolstering our capabilities is really building new business lines. So that was five, six years ago in the safety security space. We've done a lot of acquisition in the cyber space. Um, most recently, Ethica. Um, so that was a big one. Uh, we're very happy with that. Um, and then there's the whole space of multi-rail that we talked about um, at the very beginning. So we had no, capa you know, no capacity, no knowledge in the real-time payment space. So Vocalink was there. Nets Corporate Services, um, we announced, um, I think in August last year, it's about hopefully closing soon, um, out of Denmark, our largest acquisition ever. And um, you know, when it comes to where are we looking, we're looking more in the real-time payment space. Um, clearly, that's a journey that we're on. Uh, we're always looking in the emerging technology space, but it's basically capability or reach. Um, today is earnings day, so we're always uh, submitting our earnings at 8 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time, so I'm going to stop right here. <laughs> okay, 3 o'clock our time, that will be, of course. Um, the final question, then, I'm actually going to bring you back to the stage session you did yesterday. You talked a lot about financial inclusion. Um, and um, I suppose my question here is that when I work around the world and stuff, I see some regulators are really supportive of that whole journey, and others are, shall we just, I, I'm going to use my words carefully here, shall we say more restrictive in that uh, they don't allow the industry to make enough money necessarily to support the financial inclusion, because ultimately someone's got to pay. And I just wondered how you see it as you look around the world, um, the, the challenges around that financial inclusion. So we, we have been um, focused on financial inclusion really to address the problem of people being financially excluded, which also means they're not participating in the digital eco uh, economy, they're not having a financial ID. So that, that is a massive issue. Uh, we've been focused on that. We said that is a contribution we can make to sustainable growth because we leverage the tech that we have for that. Fantastic. Um, we pulled, um, 2015, we said we're going to pull half a billion people into the formal financial system. We're just on the cusp of achieving that. So 2020, we said we will do it, and we will do it. Um, we just think about the next goal right now. So the question then is what has worked and what has not. When this goes into the kind of NGO space, and it's, these are models, let's say, uh, you know, mobile money solution, digital wallet type of solutions that in the end do not have enough incentive for the local bank sector or you know, the fintech community to get involved, it's, it never works. So um, interchange is a model of balancing um, you know, the incentives is one, but um, oftentimes, 
because that's generally more card related, takes slightly heavier infrastructure and, and cost and so forth, not the only model. So balanced fee models, all that. So our engagement has been leveraging actually you know, partnership with the World Bank to go to regulators and tell them this is what has worked and what has not worked. So today we have in 80 countries, 750 programs that have a wide variety of economic models to make that stuff work. Financial inclusion is too important, and I think there's enough learnings now to say what works and what doesn't. And with that, please put your hands together for a great chat. Thank you very much, sir.